Okay, so in this worked example, what we want to do is do a full analysis of this compound cross section. So what we have here is essentially an I-beam that has a steel plate welded to the bottom of it. And this is quite common. You'll see this fairly regularly. The things that we're asked to find are the elastic moment for this cross section. We then want to find the fully plastic moment and then the shape factor. And we can assume that this is uh, high strength steel uh, with a yield strength of 350 newtons per millimeter squared. So all of the dimensions that we need are on the cross section. The first thing that we're going to do is work out the second moment of area for this compound cross section. Now in order to do that we need to find the position of the neutral axis and because this plate is welded to the bottom of this cross section that's going to move the neutral axis, it's going to pull that neutral axis further down towards the bottom of the section. So in order to find the neutral axis we're going to take area moments about some reference axis. So we want to determine the neutral axis position in order that we can calculate I, the second moment of area, about that neutral axis. And in order to do that, as I say, we take area moments about the top of the section. So we can take area moments about any reference axis, but it's just convenient to choose the very top of the section. This is quite a straightforward idea. And all it says is that if I was to take the area of my section, the total area of the full compound section, and if I was to multiply that by y bar being the distance from my reference axis to the global neutral axis position, which is what I'm looking for, so y bar is what I'm after in this case, that would be that that quantity, that those two things multiplied together would be the same, I would get the same thing as if I dealt with each one of my, air, my sub areas individually, or if I broke up that compound area and dealt with each one of them individually and added them all up. So it's, it's, it's called an area moment because it's simply taking an area and multiplying it by a distance. Okay, so that's the sort of moment idea coming in there. So all I'm saying is if I take the area of the section, multiply it by y bar, the distance I'm looking for, which is from the top of my cross section to the position of the neutral axis, that's unknown, that will be the same as summing that same quantity for all of the sub areas. So the sum for i equal to 1 to some number n, depending on how many sub areas I break it into, times a n times y bar n. If you've not seen this technique before, um, it'll become clearer now as I, as I do it. Rearranging because I want to get y bar on its own. So the a here in the, in the denominator is a total, the total area of the combined section. So I can work that out. So essentially what I'm going to do here is I'm going to break this compound area into an area for the top flange, then an area for the web, an area for the bottom flange, and then an area for the bottom plate. So this compound area is going to be divided up into four simple rectangular sub areas. So dealing with the top flange first, so that's the area of the top flange multiplied by the distance from the reference axis. Okay, so my reference axis here is simply the axis here, okay, the, the top and axis that runs along the very top of the section. And my y bar n, in this case, the, it is going to be 10. Okay, so all that is is the distance from my reference axis to the centroid of my sub area. Okay, so centroid of my sub area. If the flange is 20 millimeters thick, the centroid of that 20 meter flange is 10 millimeters down into the depth of it. And so that represents the difference or rather the distance between the local centroid of the flange and my reference axis. So that's what I'm looking for. I can do the same thing for the web. So my 325 here is just taking my the, the centroid, the local centroid of the web itself. And it's the difference or the distance rather from that local centroid of the web up to my reference axis there, which was 325. And I do the same for the bottom flange and then the bottom plate. And that's then divided by the area, the total area. So I'll just label those up. When you crunch the numbers, you get y bar equal to 415. So that's telling me that the neutral axis for this compound area is 415 millimeters from the top edge of this section, or from my reference axis. So now I can use the parallel axis theorem 
um, to determine the second moment of area about that neutral axis. Now, what the parallel axis theorem is, in case you haven't come across it before, it's a way of calculating the second moment of area about an axis that's not a centroidal axis. So about an axis that is parallel to a centroidal axis, but moved some distance away from it. So we're going to determine the second moment of area about a neutral axis that is somewhere down here. And so the parallel axis theorem tells us that the second moment of area, in my case, it's about my neutral axis. My second moment of area about the neutral axis is going to be equal to, it's a similar idea to area moments where we're combining the, the contributions of various different sub areas together. So it's, imagine I have a sub area that I'm considering here, right? So it will be, if I want the second moment of area about my neutral axis, I would take the second moment of area about the local neutral axis for the sub area, and again, this will make more sense when you, you see the numbers put into it, plus the area itself times the distance between the two axes squared. Now, if I have multiple sub areas that make up my compound area, which I do in this case, there would be a subscript n here, and I would sum over all of my, I would sum over all of my sub areas. So the sum for i equal to one to n. And y bar here is just the distance between each axis. Okay, so the neutral axis, the global neutral axis, and the local centroidal axis for my sub area. So we can visualize this, I'll just sketch it out now and we'll be able to work out what all of these different vertical distances are, these Y bars are. Okay, so because we know the geometry of the cross section and we now know the position of the neutral axis, we can fairly easily go ahead and work out what all of these different Y bar values are. Okay, so now we can go ahead and determine the neutral axis, or rather the second moment of area about the neutral axis by just considering the contribution that each of these four different sub areas make towards that, that second moment of area. So we'll do these one by one and we'll consider the top flange contribution first. What the parallel axis theorem says is that the, I, the contribution of this sub area, the top flange, is going to be the second moment of area of that top flange about its local neutral axis or centroidal axis, which is just going to be BD cubed over 12, the standard formula for second moment of area, about a centroidal axis. So we can say 250 times D in this case is the depth of the flange cubed over 12 plus as where the parallel axis theorem part comes in. It's the area that I'm considering, which is 250 times 20, times the distance between the two axes squared. So the, the distance between the local centroidal axis of the sub area and the neutral axis, the global neutral axis. And we worked that out to be 405 millimeters. And we can do the exact same thing for the various different other sub areas. And we'll do that now for the web, the bottom flange and the bottom plate. Okay, so those are our four different contributions. Um, and so the second moment of area for this compound section is simply the summation of these four different components. So it's fairly straightforward now to determine what the elastic moment is. We simply use the engineer's bending equation. So we know 
my, the yield moment, is going to be the yield stress times the second moment of area by the neutral axis divided by y, the distance, distance between the neutral axis and the edge of the section. So we can simply plug numbers straight into that. So that's the first part of this question answers. The yield moment, the elastic moment, is 1,404.4 kilonewton meters. And at this moment, the stress at the top of the beam section is equal to the yield stress, which is 350 newtons per millimeter squared. So it would be useful at this point to also find out what is the stress, the corresponding stress at the bottom of the section. So again, we can use the very same equation to work that out. Okay, so we can see that the stress at the bottom of this cross section would be 210.8 newtons per millimeter squared. So it hasn't it hasn't reached the yield stress yet. Um, so it, assuming that the loading pattern on this particular beam uh, induces compression in the top flange, it will be that top flange that will begin to yield first. So it might be helpful just to visualize the stress distribution in the section. So that's the stress distribution at the point at which yielding is just about to start in the cross section. So in order for us to determine what the plastic moment is, remember this section has more capacity left in it before it becomes fully plastic and a hinge forms. So in order for us to calculate what that plastic moment is and that extra capacity, we have to first of all determine an axis that is an equal area axis. So we need to find some axis location that splits this compound area into two equal areas, top and bottom. So we sort of have a very straightforward exercise, first of all, to solve for that equal area axis. So we can do that next. Okay, so I've set up a, a diagram here, which essentially marks on an equal area axis, a position H down into the or a depth h down into the web so the depth between flanges right so the the height of the web here is 610 millimeters so i'm making the assumption that the equal area axis lies somewhere in the web right so if it is a position h down from the very top of the web the web being the centerpiece of the beam here well then the bit below the equal area axis, okay, the remainder of the web, the height of the remainder of the web is given by 610 minus h. And all I need to do is set up an equation for two equal areas um, and solve for h. So if I work out what the area as a function of h is for the area above the equal area axis. So that's the area above the equal area axis and that's got to equal the area below. And solving for h, H is 605. So the equal area axis is just, only just within the height of the flange. So our initial assumption is valid. So at this point, what we need to do, now that we have the equal area axis, we need to look at what are the stress resultants or the forces that are developed in that cross section when it is fully plastic. So we'll do that by, by first of all sketching the cross section again, drawing on the stress distribution, the fully plastic stress distribution, and then sketching out what are the force resultants or rather the stress resultants, which are forces acting on each area or each sub area. Okay, so here we have the cross section itself. We have the stress distribution, uh, the fully plastic stress distribution. So all fibers have reached their yield stress and can go no higher. And then the diagram on the far right are the stress resultants, but the, the stress resultants for each individual area. So F1, for example, is the product of the area of the flange multiplied by the yield stress, because that's the stress that's developed in the flange. F2 uh, is, is similarly the area of the web above the equal area axis multiplied by the yield stress. And then F3 is the small area below the equal area axis of the web 
F4 is the corresponding force that develops in the bottom flange and F5 is the force that develops in the bottom plate. And then at the L1, L2, L3, L4 and L5 are simply the lever arms. So the distances between the lines of action of the various different forces and the equal area axis about which we're taking moments to determine the overall moment of resistance, plastic moment of the section. And so the plastic moment can simply be determined by the summation of each individual force times its lever arm. Okay, so it's the same as you would for any cross section. You take the, the force that develops across an area in that cross section, you multiply it by a lever arm to get a moment of resistance. And each of these is determined the various different forces and the various different lengths by sort of simple geometry and arithmetic. So there's nothing too complicated in this. So I'll just rattle through what each of these are, calculating each of these. Okay, so finally we can calculate NP. Okay, so NP is just over 1800 kilonewton meters. Um, and that's quite a substantial gain on top of the elastic moment, which was only 1400 kilonewton meters. So the very last thing that we have to do now that we know the elastic moment and we know the plastic moment, how much further we can go beyond that elastic limit before full hinge formation occurs, we can go and calculate the shape factor. And the shape factor is simply the ratio of plastic moment to elastic moment. 1.29 and you'll find that for any, any eye section, that's, a, that's quite a typical shape factor in around 1.3. So that completes the analysis of this compound cross section. So if you can understand and follow through with that analysis, you should be able to apply the exact same techniques to analyze any, any cross section you like. So we'll leave that one there for now.